Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Aphrodite, and it's time for another daily dose of Universes Beyond Assassin's Creed spoilers. So we've reached day two of spoiler season, I believe we should get the full set tomorrow, so a super short spoiler season this time, but we've got a ton of stuff to talk about today. We got some cards that maybe could show up in modern, some sweet new combo -y commanders, and a bunch of other stuff, which means we should probably jump right into it start talking new assassin's creed cards before we do a couple of quick reminders first if you need any of these cards you can snag them from our sponsor card kingdom over at cardkingdom.com slash mtg goldfish second to keep up on all the latest previews throughout the day you should head on over to mtgpreviews.com anyway let's talk universes beyond assassin's creed So first up today, we get a new Is It 3 drop commander in Shao Zhan. So Shao Zhan, a 3 minute 3 theory legendary human assassin, as long as it's your turn, has flying and first strike, and then you can tap to untap artifacts you control for it to deal 1 damage to each opponent. So if that ability looks familiar, Shao Zhan is basically Gurper Ether Grid, but on a body. There is kind of a downgrade here where Gurper Ether Grid can hit creatures, although in all honesty, normally Ether Grid is pinging your opponent's face to try to close out the game. So Shao Zhan does that exactly as well as Gurper Ether Grid, with the huge upside that you can play as your commander, and I think this makes Shao Zhan a pretty powerful combo commander. There's a few different ways that you can use this ability to go infinite. Probably the most competitive is the Isochron Scepter Dramatic Reversal combo. Uh, if you don't know this one somehow, if you get Dramatic Reversal, which can untap all your non-lands on a Scepter, you can pay two using Mana Rock Mana to cast Dramatic Reversal with Scepter, it'll untap all your Mana Rocks and your Isochron Scepter. If Shao Zhan is on the the battlefield you can probably tap a couple random artifacts in between to deal each of your opponents a damage and then untap everything do it again basically infinite mana infinite damage win the game on the spot it's also really good with curiosity its ability by itself like tap two artifacts for one damage to each opponent is kind of like meh but if you put a curiosity on Shao Zhan, it gets kind of wild curiosity says whenever enchanted creature deals combat damage to an opponent you can draw a card since Shao Zhan's ability hits each opponent for a damage every time you tap two artifacts you're gonna end up drawing three cards which is kind of a ridiculous card advantage engine so that is another really cool trick for this card you can also go infinite with Malcolm Kenai Navigator in something that turns Shao Zhan into a pirate so Malcolm's ability is whenever a pirate you control deals damage to your opponents you create a treasure token for each opponent that was dealt damage this way so the trick is if you make Shao Zhan into a pirate you can tap two artifacts it'll deal one damage to each opponent you'll get three treasure treasures with Malcolm, and then you can tap two of those treasures to activate Shao Jun again, deal a damage to each opponent, make three treasures, tap two, deal one, tap two, deal one, basically infinite damage and infinite mana in the form of treasure tokens from Malcolm, which you probably don't need the infinite mana because you're going to win the game on the spot, but in case you don't somehow, you're going to have a huge pile of mana left over. So Shao Jun, I actually think is a pretty interesting combo commander. In modern, I'd be surprised. I guess it could play like a Gurper Ether Grid role, and maybe there's some argument for it. In the past, part of the power of a card like Gurper Ether Grid, which was played as like a sideboard card in Lantern Control or some affinity decks, is a way to win through Stony Silence. But part of the upside of that card was it was an enchantment, right? And enchantments were really, really difficult to kill. Now that's not really true anymore because of cards like Besaju and Pick Your Poison. There's like so many things that can deal with an enchantment that maybe we're at a place where if you do you want a Gurper Ether Grid effect in your sideboard? Maybe there's an argument to just playing this over literal Gurper Ether Grid. It might actually be more resilient in some matchups. So Shao Zhan, maybe some sideboard potential in modern. Definitely an interesting combo commander. We all still got a pretty sweet Naya legend in Heavy the All Fathered. So it's a six mana Naya six six God Warrior. It's a legendary creature. It says as long as you have four more historic cards in your graveyard. So artifacts, legends, sagas. It's indestructible and then the exciting ability whenever it or another legendary creature you control dies return target legendary creature card with lesser mana value from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped so this is another card that i think is mostly a combo card like sure you could play it for value just like get it on the battlefield with a bunch of legends as your stuff dies you're gonna get back legends from your graveyard so it's kind of protection for removal and wrath assuming you get a full graveyard but i think what you really want to do with this card is use it like a aura skyclave harrow fan or a scrap trawler which 
which are very similar abilities except for artifacts or clerics rather than just any historic permanent but use it as one of these combo pieces to go infinite so the best way to do this is you need a sack outlet probably like a ashnod's altar phyrexian altar and then you need one very specific legend in Safi eric's daughter so Safi eric's daughter it's this two mana two two legend that says you can sack it and then when target creature is put into your graveyard from play this turn you return that card to play so imagine this setup you got the have you out you got a ashnod's altar you got your Safi, and then you have some big legend on the battlefield let's say ow the dawn sky so what you do is first off you sack Safi, targeting the owl so when owl dies it's going to come back into play then you can sack the out of the ash nods altar uh, the owl will get its ability where you get to get a card from your library put counters on stuff you'll make mana with ash nods altar it'll also trigger heavy so you can return a legend of lesser mana value to play so let's say you return uh maybe it's sushi to play and then you return it sushi to play and then you sacrifice the sushi you get some treasures you make mana with ash nods altar and then you can use that to get something mana value three or less that's a historic card into play so you get a pnlr into play and you make a thopter token and then you take the pnlr and then i'll get back to safi and then you can start the loop back over again in all honesty this was kind of a convoluted version of it you don't really even need the itsushi or pnlr just have a safi eric's daughter and essentially any legend that's more expensive than safi eric's daughter is gonna let you do that loop you can just uh Use your Safi, target the Owl, sack the Owl to the Ashnod's Altar, get the Owl trigger. Uh, that will be able to get back Safi since it's a lesser mana value historic card. And then you do it again, do it again. Infinite enters the battlefield triggers, infinite leaves the battlefield triggers. Depending on your sack outlet, infinite mana most likely with an Ashnod's Altar, Fraxine Altar. So I think that's the power of Kavi. It's a card that enables some really, really strong combos. And you're always going to have access to it since you have it in the command zone. As I mentioned before, the other upside of this card is it's not that that bad when played fairly like assuming you're a legendary theme deck or historic deck I think you're most commonly going to play this with legendary creatures because of the second ability but let's say you're a legendary creature theme deck you get down your heavy you might even be able to make it indestructible if you get some historic cards in your graveyard and then your opponent blasphemous axe you're just going to get a bunch of stuff back from your graveyard from your board dying even from heavy dying you get a bunch of stuff back from your graveyard it does line up poorly with exile sweepers like farewell which is kind of annoying but against a wrath of god a blasphemous Assassin, Toxic Deluge, even just his Wrath Protection, the card's pretty powerful. So I actually think Heavy the All Father seems like a really strong card. It seems like a good commander that you can build some really sweet combos around, and also a fine 99 card for legendary theme decks. If you're playing Dahada or Jota or whatever, some deck gets built around legendary creatures. I think this card is almost always going to make the cut in the 99. In modern, I think it's probably a little bit too expensive to really have an impact. Those same combos we were talking about with like Safi Eric's Daughter and Assassin outlet you can do them in modern with heavy the only problem is it's six mana Ugh, modern games just usually don't go that long there's a lot of free interaction even for indestructible stuff like solitude so i'd be surprised if it was really competitive in modern but it could be a fun against the odds at least we also got a new two drop boros legend in arbez mirror so arbez two mana two two legendary human assassin whenever it or another non-token historic bourbon enters the battlefield under your control it deals one damage to each opponent and you gain one life so Arbaz also has some combo potential it's kind of like a mixture of like a reckless fire weaver and a corpse knight unfortunately the non-token mode does power it down quite a bit if this triggered off treasure tokens and clue tokens it would be really really strong only working with non-tokens though can still make it a payoff for some infinite combos like for example heartless summoning mirror retriever combo if you've never seen this if you get heartless summoning down your mirror retrievers are free when they die you can return the other one to hand so essentially you just keep casting mirror retrievers forever since they are non-token his historic permanence is artifacts every one that you cast is going to be draining your opponent for one they're going to take a damage you're going to gain a life eventually you just use it to close out the game so i think that's the kind of potential that arbaz has also seems really sweet in some carrot clan ironwork style decks i think this might be how i would build around arbaz in commander is you play arbaz you play a bunch of artifacts you play carrot clan ironworks maybe something like scrap trawler to keep looping him from your graveyard and you just keep sacking your artifacts getting him back into play have this huge combo turn and arbaz probably just wins you the game from all of the artifacts entering the battlefield so it seems really powerful in that context in modern 
maybe this could see play in like a Boros Legends deck. That was the one place I could think of. And we've talked about this deck a couple times during spoiler season, just because there's such a strong historic theme to this set. And it works really well with Legends. But there's been this fringe deck in Modern with like Mox Amber, Flowering the White Tree, other cheap Legends like Ragavan or Maria Square of Ron. I think Arbaz, maybe you could play in this deck. One of the things about this deck is you don't really want to play four copies of most of your cards because they're all Legends. So you're going to run into this issue where you're Legend ruling yourself. So I don't think Arbaz will be like a four of or anything, but I could certainly see playing a copy. Having a card that gives you a little bit of reach to close out the game seems really strong in the deck, because one of the things that happens with the deck is you get in this early rush of aggro damage, but then your opponent stabilizes at like five life or something. Arbaz seems like a really nice way to get in those last few points of damage to close out the game once your opponent gets their defenses set up. And Commander... I think it's worth considering in legendary theme decks mostly. Uh, Jota the Unifier, Dehada, Shrew, and Hazaret. These decks are kind of built about putting a lot of legends into play. And Arbaz is a nice incidental life gain effect. That's something I've really come to value in Commander, is cards that are not true life gain cards, but cards that like incidentally gain you some life. Because it's really rough to be the person that like gets off to the fast start, you get targeted, your board gets dealt with, you're down to like 10 life when everyone else is at 30 or 35. That's not the position you want to be in in Commander. So these kind of cards that can incidentally gain you some life really really strong in those scenarios so I think I'd consider including this in like Jota for sure decks that are just about flooding the board with legendary creature so Arbaz some combo potential fairly efficient if it triggered on tokens this card would actually be kind of busted even with the non-token restriction though it definitely has some uses next up we get a new legendary vehicle in Jackdaw so Jackdaw a three mana is it four four vehicle it crews for three and it says whenever it deals combat damage to a player you may discard your hand if you do draw a card for each artifact you control so jack draw has a really strong ability right being able to draw a card for each artifact you control in an artifact deck is very very powerful it's kind of like a wheel of fortune almost maybe a better wheel of fortune because you can get more than seven artifacts on the battlefield kind of like the backside of braided net almost and i think if you can build your deck in a way that has a bunch of artifacts and you can make sure you're getting in hits with this card it is worth including in your deck the big challenge for jackdaw is it is just a 4-4 four, four ground creature, and crew 3 is a pretty high number. So in 60 card formats, it's hard for me to imagine really being able to get in with this vehicle. We've seen time and time again that the good vehicles in 60 card magic pretty much all have evasion. There's very few vehicles without flying that actually see playing constructed. So I'm worried that in 60 card formats, it's probably just going to be too hard to actually get in hits with this. But in an artifact commander deck where you can make it unblockable or attack whoever, you know, doesn't have a creature at the time, I I could certainly see playing this in my deck. I think it's designed to work with Edward Kenway, since we have this new, like, vehicle piratey artifact commander. I don't really know the lore of Assassin's Creed is Jackdaw, like, Edward Kenway's boat or something. Like, it seems like that's a possibility, because it definitely seems like these cards are designed to work together. But otherwise, I could see playing this mostly in artifact decks. I guess you can play it in vehicle decks, although vehicles, I'm not sure you get enough artifacts on the battlefield. You really want this to be at least a Wheel of Fortune, right? You want at least seven artifacts on the battlefield if you're going to be discarding your hand but in a go white artifact like maybe brea ethereum shaper or an artifact deck that cares about getting artifacts in your graveyard like tensin wants to craft with artifacts you can craft with artifacts in your graveyard so just wheeling artifacts into your graveyard to set up your commander is actually a really strong line so in those kind of decks i'm actually pretty interested in trying jacked off as i said before in modern i don't think it's gonna make it like <sighs> Three mana in Affinity, an artifact deck in Modern, is getting you the most powerful card in the deck in Simulacrum Synthesizer. You're not trying to set up for like, oh, on turn four, I'm going to draw a few cards. You're trying to like play Synthesizer and set up winning the game on turn four. Plus, in Modern, you already have Thought Monitor and Thought Caster. Plus, you might be staring down an Orcish Bowmasters, which would make this card pretty risky. I'm imagining you like actually do the thing in the Jackdaw against the odds. You hit your opponent, you get ready to draw like 20 cards, and your opponent just flashes in Bowmasters, and you die to your card draw. So I don't think it's gonna make it new modern but in the right commander deck i think it's actually a pretty sweet vehicle we also got a new boros human assassin in aya of alexandria so a four mana four three legendary human assassin it is medicine lifelink and it says whenever a historic creature you control deals combat damage to a player create a one one black assassin creature token with menace so this is 
a potentially powerful ability, right? You need a bunch of legends, but if you have a bunch of legends or artifact creatures, also work really well with this, uh, but if you have a bunch of artifact creatures or legendary creatures, every single one of them that gets in combat damage is gonna be making a 1-1, one -one, which is a nice little bonus. So where does this card fit? So one possibility, is legendary theme decks this is where i'm not exactly sure i was looking on edh rec it boros legendary commanders right now number one is shrew and hazaret which makes a lot of sense but shrew and hazaret is kind of a go tall legend deck right because drew and hazaret lets you cheat a legend into play from the top of your deck you're really incentivized to play these really big expensive legends i uh, kind of want you to go the other way it wants you to play a whole bunch of cheaper legends to kind of swarm the board which makes it more like a mary or a Cadric even. So I think this serves a role in Commander. If you want to play Go Wide Boros Legends, this is actually a sweet option, plus the tokens and in a sub-theme. You can play some token shenanigans on top of it. So it seems like a fun build around. The other place where I would consider playing this card is in the 99 of decks that are built around making artifact tokens. So think of like Anim Pakel, for example. It makes these gnome tokens an increasing amount based on its size as it attacks. I is going to work really well with that because your gnome tokens are artifacts which are historic so when they deal damage you're gonna make assassin tokens too so you get the double snowball going you're like pnlr general ferris rockrick making four four artifact golems and i is multicolored so it'll trigger ferris rockrick when you cast it new edition kaith which has fabricate so all of your creatures when they etb can make a servo token which is an artifact in these decks i think you might get enough value out of aya to make it worth playing in the deck because you're just gonna have a bunch of artifact tokens and each one of those when they deal combat damage is gonna come along along with an assassin friend. So I, uh, too expensive for modern, I think, but in commander, it certainly has some upsides. Plus a four mana, three, four menace lifelink, not a horrible body. We also got a new two drop assassin in Desmond Miles. So Desmond Miles, two mana, one, three, legendary human assassin. It has menace. It gets plus one, plus zero for each other assassin you control and each assassin card in your graveyard. And when it deals combat damage to a player, surveil X, where X is the amount of damage dealt to that player. So this card is in intriguing if there is an assassin deck in modern and i'm not convinced there is an assassin deck in modern but if there is i could see this being a part of it right it is going to get pretty big pretty fast like let's say you play a one drop assassin into this on turn two you have a two three menace which isn't exciting but then the next turn you can play another assassin or two maybe to three or four power with menace then you hit your opponent and surveil three or four which should get some more assassins in your graveyard next thing you know desmond miles by like turn three or four is going to be pretty huge so it does have a nice bit of snowball action. The question is going to be, is there really going to be an assassin deck in modern? And so far, the power level of Assassin's Creed hasn't convinced me that we're going to see it. It would be cool if there was, but I'm kind of skeptical that assassins are actually going to be playable. On the other hand, it seems like a nice addition for assassin commander decks, specifically some of the new assassin commanders that care about things being in the graveyard. For example, Retin Hick Theon wants equipment in your graveyard so you can reanimate them when it gets in combat damage. Or Altair cares about having assassins in your graveyard. So in those decks in specific, this seems like a staple level two drop where if you care about assassins and you care about having your graveyard being full, Desmond seems just like a really solid addition. I guess it's fine in any assassin's deck even if you don't have a graveyard sub theme it's still probably good enough to make the cut so we'll have to wait and see on modern if assassins emerge i could see desmond miles being a part of it for now though seems like a sweet two drop for commander we also got mary ready and annie bonnie so mary and annie a three minute three three legendary human assassin pirate it is haste you can tap it to draw a card and discard a card and whenever you discard an island a pirate or a vehicle create a tap treasure token so by itself eh, i mean three minute three three that taps to loot and maybe makes a treasure it's fine i think the exciting part of this card is how it interacts with wheel effects so that last ability on marion and i doesn't care about how you discarded the card right like sure you can discard it to its own looting ability but you don't have to so something like wheel of fortune wheel of misfortune windfall any of these big wheel effects that are going to cause you to discard your hand and draw a ton of cards can potentially make you a ton of treasure tokens i think it's even possible 
possible to build like a full-on combo wheel deck with this card if you add Amulet of Vigor to the deck. So Amulet of Vigor just makes it so if a permanent enters a battlefield tapped under your control, you get to untap it. The one downside of Marionette is the treasures come into play tapped, right? So you can't just chain together wheel effects because you're going to run out of mana eventually. But if you have Amulet, then you can wheel maybe discard, you know, four or five cards that'll trigger Mary and Anne, make four or five treasures, they're gonna untap themselves, and hopefully you're onto another wheel to do it again, and do it again, and do that to make a huge amount of mana, draw through your deck, eventually set up your combo kill. Also seems like a pretty sweet addition to various pirate decks, because pirates have a treasure sub thing. Think about Captain Storm, for example. It wants artifacts ETBing, because it's gonna put counters on things. So every treasure that you're making is gonna synergize with your Captain Storm, or with your Malcolm also cares about treasure. Some of the best pirates are mass treasure producers, Dockside Extortionists, Captain Lannery's Door, Pitiless Plunder. So when you think about it, pirates, typically you're going to have treasure synergies in their deck anyway. And Mary and Anne just fit really well into that plan. So I think I would jam this just for value in a pirate deck. Just use it like a fair looter that's going to make me some treasure tokens, synergize with the rest of my plans. Maybe I focus on sneaking a wheel or two into my pirate deck because of them. Plus pirates have some graveyard synergies too. And it could be a sweet build around commander we also got a new four mana mana rock in crystal skull isu spyglass so four mana legendary artifact it taps for a blue mana it also says you can look at the top card of your library at any time and you can play historic lands and cast historic spells from the top of your library so historic spells again artifacts legends and sagas so is this card good so it's kind of a expensive mana rock but it also gives you the upside that you can cast artifacts sakas or legends off the top of your deck the problem i see with this card is there's some competition for this slot so even just in blue we have reality chip that lets you play anything off the top of your deck but you'd have to equip it to something we have future sight a little bit more mana doesn't make any mana but just lets you cast anything off the top of your deck we have mystic forge which is specifically for artifacts so it's not gonna let you cast your sagas or your legendary creatures but it does let you cast all your artifacts and then there's also like the fourth doctor which kind of has the same ability but you can only do it once each turn so crystalis i think it's most similar to me to mystic forge i think if you're an artifact deck that's playing mystic forge i think you're probably going to be playing crystal skull as well either as a backup to mystic forge or maybe instead of mystic forge i think mystic forge Man, I'm really torn. It might be better. The upside of Mystic Forge, right, is you can tap it once to change the top card to your library. Crystal Skull isn't going to do that, but Crystal Skull does make a mana, which is nice. So it gets around another form of fizzling, which is not having enough mana to cast the spells off your top of your deck. But really, in a deck that wants this effect, I think the redundancy is going to be good. The other big upside of Crystal Skull is it works with legendary lands. It works with artifact lands as well. But being able to cast a Gyrage Sanitarium, Manamo, Inventor's Fear, or whatever off the top of your deck that's a nice little bonus there because if you think about how these effects fizzle a future site a mystic forge it's typically by hitting too many lands in a row on the top of your deck like that's the easiest way to fizzle the chain of value that you're casting off the top of your library however if you could somehow build your deck so all your lands are legendary which isn't going to be realistic most likely but even if you make most of your lands legendary you're going to greatly improve your odds of being able to just keep chaining and chaining and chaining things together so i really like that it works with legendary lands of course also infinite combos the same infinite combos that work with any of these effects uh, sensei's divining top plus a way to reduce the cost of sensei's divining top you can just play the top for free off the top of your deck tap it to draw a card it goes back on the top of your deck you play it for free off the top of your deck essentially you get to draw your entire library so something to keep in mind if you are playing crystal skull might be worth adding this combo to your deck so i think this is a card that I would consider playing in the kind of decks that want Mystic Forge. Like, if you're Psymaster Thopterist or Joy or a Weatherlight Captain, Emery Lurker, The Lock, I think this card is at least in the conversation. I guess you could play it in some sort of five color legend deck too, although it gets a little less exciting to me with legends. One of the upsides of having these effects work with artifacts is artifacts tend to be really cheap and colorless, so they're fairly easy to chain together. Legendary creatures, on the other hand, usually a little more expensive, a little bit more color intensive, so I think its main home is going to be artifact decks but it could work in some of the legend decks as well we also got 
a new equipment, Majlinar Stormhammer, which I'm sure I did not say that name right, which is fine because the card kind of sucks anyway. Formula Legendary Equipment. When it enters the battlefield, attach it to target legendary creature you control, and then when equipped creature attacks, you tap target creature defending player controls and put a stun counter on it, and then it deals damage to each opponent equal to the number of tapped creatures that opponent controls, and it equips for four. So I think the Stormhammer... I think it's just too expensive for what it does. Like, four mana to cast is kind of a lot. It is nice that you get one free equip out of it, but once that first equip wears off and your opponent kills that creature, then you gotta pay four to equip it again. And what it does just isn't that exciting to me. Like, yeah, it's nice that it gets a blocker out of the way, even for two turns thanks to the stun counter. And it might deal some amount of damage, but it really depends on the scenario. I think if I was gonna be interested in this card, it would have to be a deck that specifically can is about tapping down my opponent's stuff. So basically that's Hilda the Icy Crown, maybe Timon and Rhoda. Those are the only commanders I can think of that actively care about just like trying to make sure that your opponent's stuff is tapped. In a deck like that, I think the Stormhammer could be worth considering. I'm not even 100% sold there just because it's so much mana to get going. But once you get it going, it's going to deal quite a bit of damage. It's going to help with your plan of having things tapped down, maybe triggering your commanders. So I think it could be worth considering there. In modern, there is literally no chance that this card sees play. It is so incredibly slow. I would be shocked. I would be absolutely floored if this saw any amount of modern play, but eh, you never know. It might see a little bit in Commander. We also got a couple new free running spells that are kind of interesting. First up, Monastery Raid. So three mana sorcery. It's a red card. It is free running of red and X. It says exile the top two cards of your library. If it's free running cost was paid, exile the top X cards of your library instead you may play the exiled cards until the end of your next turn. So this is essentially a bad Ren's Resolve, right? It's a Ren's Resolve for one more mana, but if you can free running it, it's like an upgraded commune with lava. Like when you free run this and you can just exile five cards for six mana or nine cards for 10 mana, it's actually a very, very powerful effect. So I think this card could have some uses. It could show up in Play from Exile Commander decks, the traditional good and prosper. I don't know if it's actually good and prosper because I don't know how often you can get in with prosper to trigger it, but maybe you can because of death touch. But in decks like that, that care about casting things from exile or just super aggro decks that have you know ragavan a cheap one mana commander that's going to be able to trigger free running really consistently it seems like it's a card that's at least worth considering in one of your card draw slots we also got an interesting new green free running spell in viewpoint synchronization so viewpoint synchronization five mana sorcery so search your library for up to three basic lands reveal them put two in the battlefield tapped one in your hand and then shuffle so at five mana this card's not very good right there's better options for ramping in your commander deck especially considering this can only get basic lands on the other hand it's free running cost is only three mana so if you deal damage with a commander assassin you get to cast it for three when you can cast this for three mana the card is kind of absurd it's a huge upgrade to cultivate in kadama's reach which only put one land into play and one into your hand this is giving you two lands on the battlefield which is at least a one mana discount on what this card would normally cost so if you're a deck that can free run this so five color assassins or a deck that's in green and has a cheap commander if your commander costs one or two mana and you're in green this card is at least worth considering assuming you're playing a deck that has enough basics to make it work so if i'm playing like skullbriar or patra or amara or agatha or eula i think this card is at least worth considering because there's a pretty good chance that you can play your commander on turn two and then in turn three hit someone with your commander and then cast this and just like mega ramp up to five mana the next turn and have an extra land left over so i think it's a card that is only going to work in certain archetypes but in those archetypes can be pretty powerful in the world of reprints we got a couple of good ones propaganda can always use more of those no matter how many times it gets reprinted it's always four or five bucks and then our exclusive mtd goldfish preview card from the set in black market connections black market connections i love this card i play this in a lot of commander decks it's kind of like a supercharged phyrexian arena get it on the battlefield the beginning of your pre-combat main phase you choose one or more of lose a life to make a treasure lose two life to draw a card or three life to make a colorless shape-shifting creature 
creature token that's a 3-2. So this is a card that was actually just reprinted in Lost Caverns of Ixalan Commander last fall, but it's still like $25. So it's actually still a very expensive reprint. Also going to be the first time that it comes to modern. I don't think that actually really matters to modern, especially in a world where we just got necro dominance. We have the one ring. I think it's just too slow for modern. But in Commander, the card is really, really good. Finally today, in the realm of random lower rarity cards, some of them are not bad, like Arno Doran. Four mana three, three gifts your assassins plus two plus zero, and it has death touch, and you can disguise it. So if you're playing like an assassin deck, you might run this. Hunter's bow is kind of intriguing. Two mana equipment. When it ETBs, you attach it to target creature you control, and that creature deals damage equal to its power to up to one creature you don't control, and it gives the equipped creature ward two in reach, and it equips for one mana. So this is kind of like a bite spell that's on an equipment. So if you're a deck that has Stoneforge Mystic or other equipment synergies, and you need a removal spell, this this could actually be a reasonable option. Smoke Bomb, I gotta shout it out just because the flavor is really good. Three mana flash, all creatures have Shroud, but then at the beginning of your upkeep, you gotta sacrifice it. And when you do, target creature you control can't be blocked this turn. I mean, you're making a Smoke Bomb, so no one can see anything and they can't target any of the creatures. Unfortunately, <laughs> It's really not good enough for Commander, I don't think. The problem with it is it only really fizzles targeted removal spells, right? And if you're playing a protection spell, you really want it to protect against Wrath, something like Teferi's Protection, or even Flawless Maneuver. So I'd be surprised if it actually showed up in many decks, but it is a really, really flavorful top-down design. So anyway, those are our daily Assassin's Creed spoilers for today. Let me know what you think of all these sweet new cards. What do you hype for? What do you build? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching everyone i hope you enjoyed it and i'll be back tomorrow with one more daily dose of assassin's creed spoilers so until then have an amazing day and i will talk to you soon looking for even more magic well you can check out yesterday's daily spoiler video here or maybe the video where i explain the mtg iceberg